very honored to have Congressman Raskin uh, to uh, lead us through his legislation, which is so very important. So I hope you will prepare yourselves for a civics lesson or a presentation on the Constitution of the United States. The 25th Amendment to the Constitution was ratified in 1967 after the assassination of President Kennedy with strong bipartisan support. Members of Congress have a duty to take all necessary action to preserve continuity of government and protect the stability and integrity of our democracy for the future. That is why today, again, it is my honor to welcome Congressman Jamie Raskin of Maryland, a constitutional scholar, as he introduces legislation to establish a commission on presidential capacity to discharge the duties and the powers and duties of the office. This is not about President Trump. He will face the judgment of the voters, but he, uh, he shows the need for us to create a process for future presidents. Throughout America's history, our leaders have created and strengthened guardrails in the Constitution to ensure stability and continuity of government in times of crisis. The 25th Amendment creates a path for preserving stability if a president suffers a crippling physical or mental problem and is, unquote, in the amendment, unable to discharge the powers and duties of his office and transfers his powers. Specifically, Section 4 of the amendment empowers Congress to set up an independent body uh, to confront such a crisis. Congress has a constitutional duty to lay out the process by which a president is, president's incapacity and the president of any party is determined. This bill honors the duty by uh, creating a standing commission uh, of top former executive officials and medical experts selected in a bipartisan, bicameral way. A president's fitness for office must be determined by science and facts. This legislation applies to future presidents, but we are reminded of the necessity of action by the health of the current president. With this bill, the Congress honors our oath to support and defend the Constitution and protect the American people. And we uphold our responsibility to preserve our republic for generations to come. Now it is my honor to yield to the distinguished gentleman from Maryland, a constitutional authority by teaching it, honoring it, and, and uh, uh, again, legislating to honor our Constitution. Congressman Raskin, thank you for your leadership. Madam Speaker, thank you very much. Um, I'm honored uh, by your words, and uh, thank you for um, inviting me to present to the press this legislation. Um, in times of chaos, we must hold fast to our Constitution. The 25th Amendment is all about the stability of the presidency and the continuity of the office. It's a tool that was adopted by overwhelming bipartisan majorities in the House and in the Senate in 1965, and overwhelming bipartisan uh, majorities of state legislatures, three quarters of whom passed it in 1967. Um, the 25th Amendment is designed to guarantee the continuing peaceful transfer of power in our country. The principal authors of the amendment, like Senators Birch Bayh and Robert F. Kennedy and Congressman Emanuel Seller from New York, wanted to resolve basic questions about stability, continuity, and succession in the office of the presidency. So section one established that if the presidency is vacant, the vice president becomes the president. And believe it or not, that was ambiguous at the time. Section two establishes that if the vice presidency is vacant, the president nominates a vice president, and by concurrent majority vote of the House and Senate, that nominee becomes um, the vice president. Section, section three established a process for the temporary transfer of power by a president who is incapacitated uh, by transmitting to the president pro tem of the Senate and to the Speaker of the House a statement establishing a temporary disability. And this has happened multiple times 
with uh, various presidents, including President Reagan, who transferred powers to uh, Vice President Bush when he underwent colorectal surgery. Now, Section 4 deals with the problem of a president who becomes incapacitated but has made no provision to temporarily transfer powers, meaning, in the words of Senator Birch Bayh, that the president is unable either to make or to communicate his decisions as to his own competency to execute the powers and duties of his office. In that case, the vice president and a majority of the cabinet or the vice president and such other body that may be established by Congress may determine that there is a presidential incapacity and notify the president pro tem and the speaker of the house of that uh, of that inability to conduct the powers and duties of office. In that case, the powers would be transferred to the vice president. Now, if you read section four, you will see that the president has the opportunity to object that he actually can conduct the powers despite what the vice president and uh, these bodies are saying. Uh, and ultimately, there would be a vote of the House and the Senate, and it requires two thirds to side with the vice president. So it's, it's made procedurally difficult to make sure that this is really only for the most extreme situations where you have a president who cannot fulfill the functions of the office. Now, it's never been necessary, but the authors of the 25th Amendment thought it essential in the nuclear age to have a safety valve option. Uh, and as they often said, we have 535 members of Congress, but we only have one president. In the age of COVID-19, which has killed more than 210,000 Americans and now ravaged the White House staff, the wisdom of the 25th Amendment is clear. What happens if a president, any president, ends up in a coma or on a ventilator and has made no provisions for the temporary transfer of power? under section three. Who has the powers of the presidency at that point? Is it the chief of staff? Is it the vice president? Is it the secretary of state? This situation is what demands action under section four. I wish that Congress had set up this permanent body 50 years ago. Uh, it did not do it, but um, we do need to do this, um, certainly in the next Congress. Uh, the framers of the 25th Amendment knew that you could not always count on the cabinet to act, and so Congress has a role to play, and that role must be totally bicameral and totally bipartisan. And the legislation that I introduced today uh, seek and, uh, would, seeks to establish a 16-member commission that could act in the event of such an emergency, and a, a chair, a 17th member, chosen by the 16 members themselves. Eight members are chosen, half by Republican leaders and half by Democratic leaders, from medical personnel, physicians, and um, other medical authorities. The other eight members are drawn from former, the ranks of former high-ranking executive branch officers, including former presidents, vice presidents, attorneys general, secretaries of defense, uh, treasury and state, and surgeon general. So. The commission is entirely bipartisan, and of course, under the 25th Amendment, it can act only in concert with the vice president, who is the key actor under the 25th Amendment. Um, so the Constitution is designed to give us the tools that we need to deal with the many crises of human affairs that can uh, affect the continuity of democratic self-government. We are um, in the middle of a momentous election, and as the speaker said, the people will decide that. But when we get through this, the problem that we're talking about today is something serious that we have to face. And uh, I'm delighted to introduce this legislation and to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Madam Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker. Can, can you address the concern here with this commission? And this is a two-part question. Number one, the idea that medical professionals will, on this commission would not have examined the president. Uh, there are ethical issues as to whether or not that's appropriate for them to rule or make an, a judgment on a president's health if they have not done that. And number two, you, you say this is, is something in the, the future Congress that should be addressed. And Speaker, you said this is not about this president. How, how can we read that at this point in time when you talk about COVID-19 this not being about this president? 
So um, I'll answer the first question. I'll let the speaker take the second. The legislation um, sets up a process by which Congress, through concurrent votes in the House and the Senate, could direct the commission to conduct a medical exam of the president. And that would include whatever the members of the commission think is necessary to determine whether or not there's an incapacity. If the president refuses and the president would have a right to refuse, that could be taken into account uh, by the commission, which would have to rule based on all of the other evidence that it has. The, uh, again, this isn't about uh, any judgment anybody has about somebody's behavior. This is about a diagnosis. Uh, a professional medical diagnosis. Uh, let me just back up for a second just to put uh, personal uh, here. Uh, when this happened, it was after the assassination of, of President Kennedy. And you may not know this, you weren't born yet, but there was no, no uh, and, and Lyndon Johnson became president, there was no vice president. And if anything had happened to President Johnson, and his health was not the greatest, the Speaker of the House would have become the President of the United States. So this sets up how you would elect another, a, a Vice President, how a Vice President would be chosen by the President, but voted upon by the House and Senate. And of course, that's what happened with uh, Gerald Ford. He was, uh, after Spiro Agnew, all that, he was appointed the Vice President and uh, very popular in the Congress on both sides of the aisle, both sides of the Capitol. I take, um, uh, I love that, the story about how that happened because on his 90th birthday, Gerald Ford came to the House, which is where he sprang from. He was the minority leader. And I said, Mr. President, I'm so honored to serve. I was minority leader at the time. I'm so honored to serve in the position that you served in. And he said to me, I served with your father. <laughs>